Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this lecture by Professor Alexander Nahamas titled Metaphors in Life, I Love You for Yourself. I'm Ben Story. I'm the co-director of Furman's TOCO program, which is sponsoring uh, this afternoon's lecture. As we get started, let me ask everyone to turn off their electronic devices. The, um, and um, uh, another just practical point, I know a number of the students. I need to turn mine you, you have to, right. Yeah, I know a number of the, um, the students here are in Professor Simmons's 6 p.m. Uh, philosophy class. He and I talked, the um, stay through the lecture, the, um, when we transition to questions, you can, you can make your way out the, um, discreetly if you can. The, um, he'll be, he's, he's okay with it if you're, a, if you're a couple of minutes late. The, um, all right, let me um, take a minute to say something about what the TOPOR program is and what we do before I introduce uh, today's speaker. So the TOPOR program exists to encourage serious and open engagement with the ethical and philosophic questions at the heart of political life. The TOEFL program includes a, a whole range of activities. We offer our signature course and lecture series, which this term is focused on the theme of love, friendship, and politics. We also sponsor a whole series of courses in the history of political thought and oversee the Society of Tocqueville Fellows, a select group of students chosen by competitive application, which meets several times a year to discuss contemporary political questions in the light of the unique perspective created by the sustained study of the history of political thought. Finally, work closely with the Political Thought Club, an independent student group that meets on Friday afternoons to read and talk about works in this tradition. Right now, we're reading Homer's Odyssey. Uh, please, uh, please come join us on Friday at 2.30 on the other side of the breezeway the, um, if you're interested in that wonderful old book. Uh, the TOEFL program is supported by a broad coalition of philanthropic organizations and generous individual donors including Ginny and Sandy McNeil. Sandy McNeil is, is here this evening. Uh, Beth and Ravenel Curry, uh, the HIP family, and the AWC Family Foundation. Our sponsors support the TOEFL program in the belief that genuine liberal education encourages students to become more thoughtful citizens and more dignified human beings. And we're immensely grateful for their support. You can learn more about the TOEFL program's many activities and how to get involved with the things we do from the materials on the table just outside the door. Check us out. If you would like a genuine liberal education while you're at Furman, we want you involved in our courses and other activities. Also, please join us after the lecture for a reception, which will give you a chance to talk with Professor Nahamas over some refreshments. And please join us on February 21st for our next lecture by Professor Diana, Diana Schaub of Loyola, Loyola University in Maryland, which will be entitled Race, Friendship, and political justice. So the theme of our lecture series this year is love, friendship, and politics. As all of you are aware, American civic life is in rough shape. There is tremendous anger abroad, and partisan opposition seems in many cases to be morphing into undisguised hatred. Americans seem to possess less and less of what Aristotle called homonoia, like-mindedness or concord, that civic form of friendship that he thought wise legislators cared about even more than justice itself. So in thinking about our theme for the year, we wondered if our increasing political bitterness might be related to the thinning out of our affections. In the most literal sense, Americans are more isolated than ever. One in four are living alone, which marks a 500% increase over the last century. Marriage rates are down, childlessness is up, and even sex, studies suggest, is actually happening less and less in spite of its ubiquity on all of our screens. <laughs> Students report that while friendship is nice, the pressures of making their way in the world leave them with little time for it. Something is sapping our capacity for affection. So what can a little lecture series do about such a problem? Not much the, uh, at a political level. <laughs> I don't want to set expectations too high. The, uh, but a hollowing out of love and friendship are, of course, even more a personal concern than a political one. After all, whatever we think about politics, 
All of us want lives that are rich in friendship and love. Happily, there's a long philosophic tradition that holds that love and friendship are human experiences that are in part constituted precisely by talking about them. The sharing of thoughts and speeches about friendship can be in itself a form of friendship. In this sense, we hope our lecture series this year can contribute in some small way to the building up of these most important of civic, of civic and personal goods. Now, we could think of no one better to begin our lecture series this year than Alexander Nahamas. Dr. Nahamas is the Edmund and Carpenter II class of 1943 professor in the humanities and professor of philosophy and, and comparative literature at Princeton University. That is a mouthful. The, uh, his interests include Greek philosophy, the philosophy of art, European philosophy, and literary theory. Dr. Nahamas was born in Athens, Greece. I note that this is the first time, although we've had many lectures about Plato and Aristotle, this is the first time we've had the opportunity to host an actual living Greek philosopher. The, uh, uh, he graduated from Athens College and attended Swarthmore College and Princeton University, where he received his PhD. At Princeton, he's chaired the Council on the Humanities, the program in Hellenic Studies, and he was the founding director of the Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts. His books include Nietzsche, Life is Literature, The Art of Living, Socratic Reflections from Plato to Foucault, Virtues of Authenticity, Essays on Plato and Socrates, Only a Promise of Happiness, The Place of Beauty in the World of Art, and most recently, a rich, moving, and accessible little book entitled On Friendship. The, um, please join me in welcoming Alexander Nahamas. Thank you very much, Professor Story. Thank you all for coming here this afternoon. Beautiful weather outside. I, from the north, would not have come into a room at all if we had weather like that where I live. Uh, I'm delighted to be at Furman University. As I've told people already, one of the very best and by far one of the most interesting students I ever had when I was at the University of Pittsburgh was a Furman graduate. And I've always been intrigued by university. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to visit, finally. I'm also particularly grateful to the Tocqueville uh, program and its donors, to the people who run it, to the students who are following the program uh, for having invited me. And I hope that what I have to give you is worth your trouble. I must admit, I have a feeling that somebody's looking over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a good guy. So <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me get started then. A young woman and her fiancé are planning the wedding. How many friends have you got in all, she asks him, as they're trying to decide on their guest list. I have no idea, he answers. Ten really good ones, ten more peripherals, a score or so right at the outside edge, virtual acquaintances, a few left over from school, a few more from college, a few picked up at work, perhaps an ex in there somewhere, one or two borrowed or stolen from other friends, an ex-flatmate or two, not as many mates as I used to have, that's for sure. A little later, she asks him in turn, he asks her in turn, how many varieties of friends are there? And she replies, and listen to this, loads. For a start, there are friends you don't like. I've got plenty of those. Then there are friends you do like, but never bother to see. Then there are the ones you really like a lot, but can't stand their partners. There are those you just have out of habit and can't shake off. Then there's the ones you're friends with, not because you like them, but because they're very good looking or popular, and it's kind of cool to be their friend, trophy friends. Then there are sports friends. There are friends of convenience. They're usually work friends. There are pity friends who we stay with because you feel sorry for them. There are acquaintances who are on probation as friends. There are enough. He finally interrupts her. Enough indeed, but if you put the wit aside, this catalog of friends, which comes from a wonderful novel called uh, White City Blue by Tim Lott, this list is not at all unlike the elaborate lists and taxonomies uh, of kinds of friends that social scientists have been producing for the past 50 years. Five stages, uh, there's children's friendships, five stages of those. Then there are friendships between young adults. Then those differ in turn from the friendships of the middle-aged and the friendships of the old. There are working class, lower middle class, upper middle class bonds, 
There are fair weather, hard sink, dangerous, fossil friends, frenemies, and what Tim Lott calls unfriends. Unfriends are the people who you introduce at a party by saying, this is uh, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, not to mention, of course, uh, friends who know each other only through the virtual spaces of social media. And the list of possibilities goes on and on and on. <coughs> now, my view is that we'll never be able to classify the types of friendships uh, and that they, we will keep proliferating them as long as we focus on the patterns of behavior to which those friendships give rise. In fact, there's just about nothing that friends can't do together, which is why, for example, you can't have a picture of a friendship, you can't recognize a picture of a friendship unless you have a title or an allusion to a myth or something like that. Because, you know, if you see somebody cutting somebody's throat, you know what it's about. If you see two naked people on a bed, you know it's about. Friends can be doing any of those things and many, many others. There's nothing that characterizes behavior of friends. So our behavior is never on its own enough to determine whether it springs from friendship or not. Any attempt to account for friendship by describing the activities that uh, it gives rise to get misses the most important point. What defines a friendship is not a particular, is not the particular actions and activities that friends engage in, but rather the motives on account of which they engage in those activities. Now, to the extent that it expresses friendship, every one of the various relationships I've been mentioning so far is accompanied by a degree of um, uh, affection and goodwill. When affection is mild, goodwill is limited. When it is deep, goodwill extends much farther. Still, I want to say, what separates my friends from the rest of the world is not that I'm moved to do good things for my friends that I'm not moved to do for the others. Most of us do all sorts of good things for people who are not our friends. Helping or doing good does not distinguish our friends from the rest of the world. It makes the difference, if that's what it was, it made the difference between our friends and the rest of the world a matter of degree, as if our friends are distinguished by the fact that we are more willing to help in their case. But this difference in degree won't do. Friendship lies somewhere else, neither in the actions of the friends nor in the desire to benefit one another. Now, within the vast range of friendships that we recognize today, I'm concerned with the intimate ties that bind us to our best and closest friends. And following Aristotle, uh, sorry, uh, the relationships that philosophers have called today called character friendships or companion or end friendships. We have all kinds of terms. And following Aristotle, contemporary philosophy, or thinking they're following Aristotle, uh, contemporary philosophers have classified our lesser friendships, our weaker friendships, into two further kinds. Friendships that depend on the pleasure that, one, that both people get out of the relationship, and friendships that depend on the benefit and the advantages that people get out of that relationship. Aristotle's standards for virtue, virtue philia, as he calls it, is the highest and best kind of philia, Aristotle's standards of virtue being very, very high, uh, virtue philia, the true friendship, so to speak, is a very, very rare phenomenon for him. Modern discussions of friendship have been much less demanding, and what we call character friendship is much more common uh, among us than virtue philia would have been for Aristotle. Still, although many of us have close friends whose character we admire, None of us has many of them. It is dif difficult and perhaps impossible to have more than a few intimate and far-reaching relationships in our lives. As Aristotle says, that requires time and familiarity. Now, Aristotle, of course, famously distinguishes in the Nicomachean Ethics three kinds of what he calls philia. The philia of the virtues, the philia of those who are attracted by the pleasure, they provide, and the filia of those who are attracted by the advantage they provide to one another. Now, the latter kind, the latter two kinds, advantage and friendship filia, are, in my view, not friendships at all. They are instrumental relationships. Those who engage in them, Aristotle writes, are not attracted to each other, but to the beneficial or the pleasant. It's the pleasure of the, the relationship that they want, not the person who provides the pleasure. And if the relationship stops providing pleasure or, friendship or, or benefit, 
it immediately is terminated. That means that our close friendships, in which we are attracted to each other, and not to what our friends can provide us with, must differ in kind from our less involved relationships. In the best relationships, a philosopher writes, the central feature of the friendship is simply that the friends love and wish, wish each other well as ends in themselves, whereas in lesser friendships, the central feature is the instrumental or means value of each to the other. But that difference, I think, is absolutely crucial. The contrast between loving our friends as ends in themselves or loving for what they are, loving them for themselves, and treating all the rest as means to our advantage or enjoyment is totally radical. It suggests that the two types of relationships are so different that the latter two can't be considered friendships at all. I know this is a revisionary thesis. I mean, Aristotelian scholarship still thinks of philia, all of philia as friendship. I really don't think it is that at all. In any case, to start capturing, uh, sorry, unlike philia, which does come in three distinct kinds, friendship does not. It comes in many degrees. Like every kind of love, it ranges from mild affection to stormy f uh, pa passion, and in all cases, it involves what, for lack of better term, we describe as loving our friends for themselves. And that's what I'm interested in. What does that mean? To capture the complexities of this, I have to begin by admitting uh, that most of my connections to other people are by and large instrumental. Not to put too fine a point to it, I use other people for my own purposes. <coughs> and so does everybody else. I know what I want from them, and my interest in them is exhausted uh, by the specific qualities that allow them to perform their particular function. Uh, the best statement of this is from Montaigne's essay on friendship, to which I'll come back in a little while. He writes, the religion of my doctor or my lawyer cannot matter. I scarcely inquire, into, uh, and scarcely inquire of a lackey whether he's chaste. I try to find out whether he's diligent. And I'm not so much afraid of a gambling mule driver as of a weak one, or of a profane barber as of an ignorant one. For the familiarity of the table, I look for wit, not prudence, for the bed, beauty before goodness, in conversation, competence, even without uprightness. What Montaigne says here, uh, sort of commits himself to wanting out of those relationships, has little, has little or nothing almost to do with a person who's providing what it is that he wants. Which is why he, and we follow him, can speak here very abstractly. From a lackey, we expect diligence from a mule driver, strength, and so on. Montaigne is after those qualities in and on themselves. He has little or no interest in the particular people who happen to embody them. He would be satisfied with any lackey who was as diligent as his current servant and would immediately replace his barber if a more competent one came along. And so would I. Uh, when, at some point, I need to have my hair cut, I search for a competent barber. Uh, beyond being competent and relatively pleasant, it made no difference to me who it was. Any equally qualified barber, any equally competent barber, would do just as well. Our relationship was not exploitative, since we're exchanging goods. Uh, it was, however, what the sociologist Georg Zimmel was the first one to call an impersonal relationship. In such a relationship, in an impersonal relationship, all that matters is how well the job's done. Though, of course, I also try to treat my barber with the respect that I would like to extend, uh, ideally, to almost everyone in the world. But some impersonal relationships can develop into something else. And I gradually found myself becoming uh, concerned with aspects of my barber's life that were not directly connected to his professional role and taking an interest in what we would call his personal life. That, as the very word suggests, turned our relationship into something more than impersonal. And for that reason, not purely instrumental either. Now, as long as our relationship was instrumental and impersonal, and you asked me why I liked my barber, his name is Thomas, I would just say and explain myself fully, uh, I like how he cuts my hair. Or perhaps, to make it clearer, uh, I don't like Thomas himself. No, I don't dislike him either. 
I just like how he cuts my hair. But as our relationship developed into this something closer, and I was no longer concerned only with his ability to cut my hair, my answer would not have been the same. Now I would say, if you ask me, I like how he cuts my hair, and I like him. But this now is very far from a full answer, unlike the former answer. It's, in fact, no answer at all. You asked me why I like Thomas, and I told you that I like him, which immediately provokes a further question, and why do you like him? Here's now a most intriguing point, I think. Although I had no problem with your question earlier, I knew exactly how to answer it. Uh, once my relationship with Thomas became personal, I no longer knew how to answer your question. Once I came to like Thomas himself, and not just what he could do for me, I could no longer explain exactly why that was so. It certainly isn't just because I like the way, the way he cuts my hair. That's not the reason, maybe one reason, but it's not the main reason I like him. But then, what else is it that causes me to like him? True, I could tell you that I like him because he is kind, entertaining, or interesting, and so on, but these answers can only go so far. They are disappointingly vague, and they explain much less than we think. Would I leave Thomas, for example, if a kinder or more entertaining barber came along? Would I replace him if a better, if a better barber came along? And why don't you prefer him to your own barber if you find him wittier than your own? Try as we might, and this is a really important point in my view, try as we might, our best efforts <coughs> to explain why we like someone are invariably vague, imprecise, and deeply unsatisfactory. They're almost always uh, banal and incomplete, sensitive, kind, intelligent, caring, yeah, yeah, always leaving out what we sense to be the most essential reasons for our feelings. When it comes to any of my friends, and once I have come to like him, my barber is my friend, however casual, it is impossible to me, for me to say, because as I shall say in a little while, it is impossible for me to know exactly why I like them, or in the case of my close friends, why I love them. What I like about them cannot be separated from their person. That is the main issue here. And our friendship is, for that reason, completely different from our impersonal relationships. This means I can't replace one friend with another as I can replace those with whom my relationship is impersonal. No one but my friend herself can play that role in my life. When my relationship with my barber became personal, even if it never became very intimate, my loyalty to him no longer depended solely on his talents. In fact, my best friend, whom I also talk about in a minute, and my wife said one day when he didn't give me a haircut, oh, you should go to someone else, you know, I know a better barber, but I didn't go. <laughs> in, if the relationship was not like that, I would immediately, uh, somebody said, hey, a guy can cut your hair really well, I would just go there without a second thought. In this case, I couldn't do it. And although I may value the intelligence of some other friend of mine, um, I will not give her up when someone still more intelligent comes along. It is not just intelligence in the abstract, as in the Montaigne case, that matters to me here. What matters, as we say, very unhelpfully, is her intelligence, or her particular intelligence, or the way her intelligence expresses itself. My friend, as we say equally unhelpfully, matters to me, not just for her features, but for herself. So, what is the difference between my friend's features and my friend herself? What is that self that I love? That's part of the question I'm going to be uh, circling around in what follows. Think, for exam example, think of the friend who no longer matters to you. Uh, not because you found out something terrible about them, or had a fight or whatever, you just lost interest in each other after a certain time often happens. Think, too, of the features that attracted you to this friend in the first place. She may still be, and probably is, just as intelligent or kind or whatever it was that she was when you first start and started your friendship, when you're close. But you're, neither, but you're now indifferent to her, and therefore, neither her intelligence nor her kindness kindle any kind of love. 
But if these had been part of your reason for liking her before, and they haven't changed, why are they not making you love her now? So if it's only the features that you're after, then if the features persist, your friendship should persist. The, the fact that the features remain the same while the friendship can disappear suggests that something much more complicated is going on, and that's what I'm trying to understand. So we saw that although I might abandon some instrumental relationship if my needs are better served by another, I would not abandon my friend just because someone with more of what I prize in my friend comes along. And that's true not just of my close friends, but also, to a lesser extent, of my more casual friends as well. My relationship with Thomas is not as strong or as passionate as my closest relationships, but it does involve genuine affection and not just an appreciation of his abilities. In other words, to repeat, there are no pleasure or benefit friendships. It is not that our casual friendships are instrumental, while our close ones are not. No friendship is purely instrumental, well, of course, no friendship is purely uninstrumental either. And when the instrumental aspects become very important, then even our closest friend becomes replaceable. If you need a very uh, complex operation, and your best friend is a very good surgeon, but the world specialist is also available, you would do well to ask your friend to assist in the operation, <laughs> rather than actually wield the knife. Uh, instrumentality, in other words, does not uh, separate one friendship, one kind of friendship, for another. It sets friendship as a whole apart from a whole vast range of other relationships. We love all our friends, not just the closest ones, for themselves, and not only for the specific things they can do for us. Instrumental friendship, I want to say, is a contradiction in terms. Now, the central point here is that if our relationship is instrumental, nothing much changes about me if someone new assumes your role in my life. The desires that I already have, the needs that I have that you, are, that you had been satisfying, continue to be satisfied by this other person as well, or even perhaps better than they were before. But when a new friend enters my life, when a friend enters my life, so does a truly new relationship. And it gives us both something we can't find anywhere else in the world. We are both changed. I can have the same relationship with several barbers, but neither Thomas nor I can have our friendship with anyone else. Nor for that matter can any two other friends have a friendship like ours. In contrast to a concrete role which several people can occupy, our friends' roles in our lives are inseparable from who they are. No one else, no matter how many features you share with them, can possibly have your place in my life, even if your place is as small as our friendship is casual. And here's that word, place, a place. That is just what Montaigne's best friend, Etienne de la Boissy, asked Montaigne to give him while Boissy, La Boissy was on his deathbed. My brother, he said, do you refuse me a place? Now, Montaigne did not understand. La Boissy, he answered, I quote, was still breathing and speaking, had a body, consequently he had his place. But La Boissy was not after that. True, true, he said, I have one, but it is not the one I need. And when all this is said and done, I will have no being left. Montaigne, at a loss, could only assure his friend that God would give him a place. Uh, soon. It took him almost 10 years to start beginning to formulate what he took La Boissy's entreaty to give him a place uh, have, had been, a plea for a place in Montaigne's own life, in other words, uh, for the friendship to remain alive after his own death and playing a continued role in what Montaigne was to become. Now, his book of essays, Montaigne is famous, of course, he, for the essays that you wrote, a huge collection of the most amazing pieces that you can imagine. He says that this book is consubstantial with its author, concerned with my own self, an integral part of my life. I am a self, he, li he writes elsewhere, the subject, the matter of my book. So, if his best and most intimate friend was to have a place in his life, it should be reflected in the essays themselves. But just where is Montaigne, in Montaigne's life, was La Boissy's place, and how could the essays reflect it? 
It took him several efforts and another decade to find the right answer. The first time he tried to find a place for uh, La Boétie was to locate his essay on friendship, which some of you have been reading this semester, uh, at the very center of the first volume of his essays. Now, at that point, that's all he was planning to publish. So by putting the essay on friendship in the middle of the essays, it, ga it gave him the most, important, uh, the most important position, and everything else would have revolved around it. In addition, Montaigne originally included within his essay on La Boétie the text of a manuscript of a book that uh, La Boétie had written called On Voluntary Servitude. An interesting, not a great book, but a very interesting book. Uh, in the self-deprecating manner, though, that was so characteristic of him, Montaigne liked, likened himself to a painter who always chooses the best spot, the middle of a wall, for his painting and fills the empty spaces around it uh, with grotesques, as he puts it, of various kinds. His own essays, therefore, he writes, and I quote, grotesques and monstrous bodies pieced together of diverse members without definite shape, having no order, sequence, or proportion other than accidental, his own essays would form the background that would allow uh, La Boise, the essay about La Boise, and within that essay, the text of voluntary servitude to allow, that it would allow his readers to see for themselves the extraordinary quality of La Boise's mind and soul, according to Montaigne. But then, the book was politically uh, ambivalent, ambiguous, and so on. Uh, Montaigne changed course. He said, you know, uh, it's been used for bad reasons, I won't, I won't put it here. Having announced at the beginning of the essay that he would put the book in it, that he would include the book uh, in it, he declares at the end that he ultimately felt it would be better to leave it out. And so, although he left his own text untouched, Montaigne very seldom erased things in the essays. And that, I think, is a very important feature. If you want, you can talk about it in the questions, why he does that. He only adds. Uh, so, he, although he left his own text intact and preserved its opening exhortation to, as he puts it, listen a while to this boy of 16, he removed La Boise's text and finally gave us not the book, but simply an explanation of its absence. So in a way, what's in the middle of the essay now is a whole. That's what it is, not a thing. Now, as I said, his official explanation was uh, not to inflame political passions, but the reasons, I think, for his decisions, whether at the time he knew it or not, went far beyond that. Had he included the text of involuntary servitude, he would have given it a discreet place within the work allowing his readers to take it up on their own, uh, read it for themselves, and come to know its author through it. Many of his readers, though, were unlikely to like the book nearly as much as Montaigne himself had liked it. In that case, his attempt to manifest his feelings as a friend would have fallen flat. Including the treatise, therefore, would have undermined Montaigne's ultimate purpose, which was to account for his love and give substance to his lament that when Boisy, La Boisy died, I was already, he writes, so formed and accustomed to being a second self everywhere that only half of me seems to be alive now. In fact, it would have been perfectly possible, perhaps likely, that even if some readers loved the book, they could still have asked themselves, that's why he loved him? Because of a good book? How could that possibly be enough to justify Montaigne's unbelievably extravagant claims for his friends' virtues and the depth of their love for each other. That is, I think, ultimately why he chose to omit the treatise from the essays, even if, as I suggested before, he wasn't quite aware of that at the time. He wasn't aware because in the very next essay, he includes a whole bunch of sonnets written by La Boétie. And he says, instead of that book, which is not that great, I'll give you those sonnets, which he says, in exchange for this serious work, I'll offer you the sonnets gayer and more lusty than the treatise. Now, the, the poems appeared in both printed editions of the, son, of the essays. The trouble is that Montaigne took a, a copy of the second edition and added unbelievably many passages to it in, manus in handwriting. And it's that text that is now published as the Essays of Montaigne. In that text, the poems are not there either. All we have is a dedication to some person and then another empty 
spot, a blank. Because even the sonnets, even the great uh, sonnets, even the great poems, uh, would have done no better than the treatise. He loved him so because of a bunch of poems. Montaigne never again tried to account for La Boise's virtue by, ci by citing his works. The whole effort was, in fact, doomed. He was the first philosopher to realize that uh, a truth that is absolutely crucial to love and friendship, namely, that any effort to explain why we love someone by citing their virtues, their accomplishments, or anything else about them is bound to fail. And here's why. The greatest part of Montaigne's classic essay on friendship describes a variety of personal relationships. It goes through uh, master, to serv master and servant, father and son, siblings and lovers, marriage, pederasty, none of which, he says, can do justice to his extraordinary relationship, which led, he writes, to the complete fusion of our wills. He also came to realize that the nature of the relationship could never be explained by a list of distinct features. It is not one special consideration, he writes, nor two, nor three, nor four, nor a thousand. It is I know not what quintessence of all this mixture, which, having seized my whole will, led it to plunge and lose itself in his, which, having seized this whole will, led it to plunge and lose itself in mine with equal hunger, equal rivalry. In the first edition of the essay on friendship, he concedes complete defeat. If you press me to tell you why I loved him, he writes, I feel that this cannot be expressed. I understand him to be saying that his love could not be expressed in general terms, what he calls considerations, since he still thought that La Boissy's sonnets might have given an accurate picture of his friend. But when in the Bordeaux manuscript, as we call the volume where he made all the corrections, he excises the poems and abandons that effort as well, he expands the original sentence. And you can see it if you look at the, at the there's a facsimile of the, of the Bordeaux manuscript. Uh, and you can see all his handwritten additions. Wonderful. He, he, what he does there is he expands a sentence with what, in my opinion, is the most moving statement ever made about friendship. If you press me to tell you why I loved him, I feel that this cannot be expressed. That's what he had written already. And now he adds, except by answering, because it was he because it was I. This extraordinary statement signifies, I think, total resignation. Montaigne is hereby giving up on the possibility of ever saying anything genuinely revealing about his friendship, which in turn raises the question, has Montaigne then failed to give himself, to give his friend a place in the essays after all? And the answer to the question is not at all. On the contrary, it's precisely in virtue, because of this non-explanation, as I like to call it, that Montaigne brilliantly redirects our attention from this, this or that distinguishable aspect of his friend's personality and of himself to the irreducible experience of the two of them together. In effect, he says, look at me and look at him, look at us both for the answer to your question. But how can we do this? Where can we find those two friends together in order to look at them as Montaigne directs us? And the, answer, and the question, of course, is where else but in the substance of the essays? It is myself that I portray, he writes, uh, Montaigne, uh, Montaigne writes, and that self is inextricably tied to his friendship with La Boissy. The essays themselves are the place he has secured for La Boissy. The essays show us what Montaigne eventually became, and he describes himself, uh, you know, completely virtues, defects, everything. He does not spare himself. And what he did become, he implies, is essentially connected to his friendship with La Boissy. But to describe, and, and, and if we want, in other words, to understand what La Boissy's place in Montaigne's life is, the only thing we can do is to understand Montaigne. <laughs> because the friendship is already part of what Montaigne is. To, interp to, uh, to uh, describe Montaigne, however, we must interpret the essays. But no interpretation will ever be able to separate out what is due to Montaigne and what is due to La Boissy. 
for they are tied together, as he tells us again and again, by this Gordian knot, a knot so complex and intimate that it could only be unraveled, which is not unraveling it, by hacking through and destroying it. The two have become or inextricably connected. In the friendship I speak of, he writes, our souls mingle and blend with each other so completely that they face the seam that joined them and cannot find it again. Montaigne knew that La Boissy's contribution to his life was unique. No one else could have done what he did for him. No one else had the same place in his life. And for that reason, their relationship could only be described in terms that applied to those two people only. Perhaps then, he was not boasting when he claimed that their friendship, I quote again, has no model by itself and can be compared only to itself. For no friendship, not just this greatest instances, can in fact be compared to any other. Who else can share that relationship but the friends themselves, who turn out to be the very people they are as a result of its agency? What then is it to love you for yourself and not just for your features or for what you can do for me? I came across the beginnings of an answer to that question when I read a short but very, very brilliantly suggestive discussion of metaphor by the philosopher Stanley Cavell. He wanted to know what we do when we try to explain what a metaphor means. His starting point was that we do not try to explain metaphors the way we try to explain literal uh, language, literal discourse. When asked to say what a, a literal statement means, he wrote, I will try to put the thought another way and perhaps refer you, depending upon who you are, to a range of similar or identical thoughts expressed by others. But metaphors don't allow for this kind of explaining. We can neither put the thought another way, nor find it expressed by someone else in different words. Instead, we paraphrase metaphors. And the paraphrase of metaphor has a very, very special feature. Here's his famous analysis or paraphrase of Romeo's famous declaration, Juliet is the Sun. Unfortunately, by doing that and by becoming very, uh, by having a lot of people read it, he convinced modern philosophy that that's the only metaphor in the world. <laughs> and that's the only metaphor people discussed for 30 years after this paper was uh, published. In fact, it's the simplest kind of metaphor. Most metaphors are not identity statements like that. But anyway, we now have realized there are another two or three <laughs> <laughs> opening our minds. But here's what he says. Romeo means that Juliet is the warmth of his world, that his day begins with her, that only in her nourishment can he grow. And his declaration suggests that the moon, which other lovers use as an emblem of their love, is merely her reflected light and dead in comparison, and so on. Now this and so on is a necessary part of every paraphrase, significant and ineliminable. It signals that the work of paraphrase, the work of paraphrasing a metaphor, is never done. It registers, uh, Cavell writes, what William Empson calls the pregnancy of metaphors, the burgeoning of meaning in them. The reason for this is that any attempt to paraphrase a metaphor is bound to be incomplete. The and so on reveals that one is aware of that incompleteness, that you haven't said everything there is to say about it. It speaks to my sense that if I were to spend more time with that metaphor, I would come to see in it things I'm unable to envisage now. It says more that I haven't seen and I hope to get it at some point. Although I make that effort only for metaphors that really matter to me, every metaphor presents a possibility to some degree or other. A metaphor that can be paraphrased without remainder, without and so on, a metaphor whose meaning can be fully expressed in different words, belongs in a dictionary. It's a dead metaphor, just like the phrase dead metaphor itself. Unlike a dead metaphor, however, a living metaphor is inexhaustible. And since the full meaning of a living metaphor is always just beyond my grasp, the fact is that I can never know fully what that metaphor means. Which in turn means that I can't use my words, I can't use words whose meaning I already know to, as we do in literal statements, put the thought another way. To say in these different words what the metaphor means. When literal language is in question, I can use distinct form of words that embody more or less the same meaning and perform more or less the same communicative function. 
and I do that in order to explain uh, <coughs> a particular expression. I can give the dictionary meaning of the words or explicate them in a looser manner. That is, I can use something else in their place to the same or nearly the same effect. But with metaphor, that kind of explication is impossible. No other words can do what a living metaphor does. A metaphor, in that sense, is irreplaceable. And that is also true of my friends. Just as what matters primarily in literal discourse is what the words communicate and not the words themselves, so in instrumental relationships, what matters is the purpose these serve and not the person who serves it. It is what you do, not who you are, that makes a difference to me. You are fungible. Another barber can do the same job, another servant can, and so on and so forth. By contrast, if we are friends, who you actually are makes a tremendous difference. Like a living metaphor, you too are irreplaceable. And here is another question now. Could our friends be irreplaceable because, just as with metaphors, we never fully know what their role in our life may be? Could our friends be, in the sense that metaphors are, inexhaustible? Let me try to explain what I mean <coughs> through a story. Several years ago, a very, very good friend, uh, I'll call him Tom because that's his name, uh, <laughs> was visiting me at home in Princeton. On a cold, wet, gray November morning, as I was getting ready to take my 10-year-old son to school, Tom said he'd come with me uh, for company. Um, we were in a hurry, so he would started coming in his pajamas. Uh, it was early in the morning. My son, being 10 years old, was totally embarrassed about that, so Tom put a raincoat over his pajamas and came. So we go to the school. The rain was terrible. There was a huge line of cars. We were waiting slowly to get to the front of the queue, and when we finally got there, I realized I had a flat tire, and I had no idea how to fix it. So I'm sitting there saying, how do I call AAA? What am I going to do? Tom gets out of the car, barefoot, pajamas, and raincoat, and changes the, the, the tire. He changes the tire. For 10 minutes, he's there, completely oblivious to the fact that he's in this ridiculous outfit, right, <laughs> doing that. Uh, everybody, the kids were amazed. They just looked like that. The adults, well, some offered to help. Others thought it was just an annoyance. Others made fun of the whole thing. A colleague of mine said, oh, what a beautiful outfit he has on, and so on and so forth. Um, of all that, Tom was completely oblivious. He fixed the tire, drove, to a drove us to a garage, discussed the situation with the mechanic, still in pajamas, barefoot, and raincoat, and returned home and went to work while I collapsed in a useless heap. <laughs> so if you ever ought to ask me why this man is my friend, that story is definitely something I would tell you. I would also <coughs> mention his talent for dealing with practical issues and the loyalty that was actually manifested in his, uh, that morning. But all that would still miss the point, which I would try to capture further by emphasizing that surrounded though he was by scores of very well-dressed people about to go to their office or the country club, his absurd outfit didn't give him a moment's thought. I would tell you that this down-to-earth practical sense coexists with a touching, spontaneous otherworldliness, which, like everything else I have mentioned about him, is completely in character. And so on. Even that, though, would fail. It would fail to communicate that no one else could have done what Tom did that morning. And if you reply that fixing a tire in a stupid outfit is not such a rare feat, not something, not something that only a friend would do, I would say to you, unhelpfully again, that only Tom could have done what he did in the particular way that he did it. It's not that I don't love my friend because he's practical. There's something right, but not quite right in that way of speaking. What's not quite right is that there are plenty of people, practical people in the world, whose practicality leaves me completely indifferent. Why then does it give me a reason to love that particular person? A story, a narrative of this sort, uh, may be more illuminating than a list of features because it is less abstract, but no narrative, again, can stand on its own. To let you see how what happened that morning both sprang from our friendship and contributed to it, I'd have to tell you more stories about Tom. 
if only to show that what happened that particular morning was rooted in his personality and in our friendship together. But even a combination of stories, whatever detail and texture they may add to my original narrative, will never be enough to explain, either to you or, for that matter, to me, why Tom and I are friends. However fine-grained, these stories will always describe something general or generalizable something of which not only Tom, but many others are capable as well. As I said, anyone, or many people at least, can fix a tire in the rain in pajamas. <coughs> Inevitably, all these stories will miss exactly what distinguishes him from all those other people who might have done the same thing. And <coughs> they, would they would fail to explain why I'm drawn to him and not to those other people. What matters, as Montaigne observed, and I quoted that before, is not one special consideration, nor two, nor three, nor four, nor a thousand. It's the quintessence of the mixture, he says, that might explain it, if such a mixture could ever be described fully. But it can't. Metaphor has brought us into the domain of the aesthetic. And I'm tempted to say that there is something aesthetic in my appreciation of Tom's actions in the schoolyard. It's only isn't moral. Aesthetic in part because what made it so touching is that although it revealed something quite new about him, I could never have predicted that he would have done that thing, it also fit in so well with what I knew about him already. What Tom did made sense. Once it happened, I could say, of course. And everybody who knows Tom, whenever I tell them that story, say, of course. <laughs> everybody recognizes him in that, even though our friendship is extremely different from theirs. It was both, what he did was both new and fitting. It made him both more complex and more coherent. In other words, it manifested his style. Aesthetic also, because nothing I say can guarantee that you would also see what I saw in his behavior. Despite all my efforts, you might very well, and not necessarily wrongly, uh, find the event ludicrous, even if you're there that morning. I like your friend's outfit, that's what that was saying. Aesthetic, finally, because it is as impossible to explain why someone is my friend as it is impossible, and here I'm thinking of Kant's third critique, to explain why I find something beautiful. Nothing I can tell, we could talk about that afterwards if you want. Nothing I can tell you about Tom's behavior in the schoolyard can make sure that you will see what I saw in it. You had to be there, we say, but even if you had been there, all you might have seen would be, would, could have been a crazy person holding up, traf holding up traffic. So some people matter to me because they provide me with things I already know I want, and my interest in them, beyond a minimum of necessary respect, uh, is limited. I know that that is not all there is to them, that they have their own lives and loves and dreams, their sorrows and disappointments, but that sort of knowledge is not itself a reason to want to know them any better and care about their lives and loves and dreams, their sorrows and disappointments, I'm content to leave the matter there. They are means to my end, and my interest in them ends with their usefulness. Other people, however, matter to me not only as means, not only for what they can do for me, but for who they are. I take their desires seriously in their own right, sometimes as seriously, sometimes even more seriously than my own. And I'm ready to change my desires to come to want new things to let their lives and loves and dreams, their sorrows and disappointments, affect and sometimes become my own. And so to change myself as a result of having come to know them. These are the people I love, and they have, each one of them has a place in my life that no one else could possibly occupy. The difference between my feelings for Thomas and my feelings for Tom is not that I like Thomas for his wit and Tom for himself, if I care for my barber or for Tom, and not just for my care cut or the condition of my house, Tom always fixes things in my house when he comes over. I always give him clothes. We, know it's, we have this we, uh, sort of symbiotic uh, arrangement. Uh, so great friendships, close friendships, can also be instrumental. I mean, before Tom visits me from California, I have a list of jobs that have to be done in the house. And I took out uh, my old ties aside to keep them. You know. So, uh, what matters to me, both for Thomas and for Tom, is something more than what we call our ascribe, that is our professional, institutional, or instrumental relationships. 
that something more, which every attempt to explain my feelings or my friends always leaves out, is what in each and every case counts as what we call their self. It involves a commitment to the future, a sense that there is more to know here and a promise that what I still don't know will be worth learning and will be in some sense or other, not a sense that I understand already, good for me. And so, what counts as our own and our friend's self varies with the nature, the intensity, and the complexity of our relationship. My interest in Thomas, like his interest in me, extends to few areas beyond those covered by our professional connection, and we keep silent about many aspects of our lives that are essential to my relationship with Tom, as many other aspects of his own life that I know nothing about are essential to Thomas's own close friendships. So friendship, like every kind of love, requires more than an appreciation of what we already know our friends to be. It also makes, as I said, this commitment to the future. Saying you're my friend or I love you, they're difficult things to say because they're not only expressions of how I feel at the moment. They're also, and crucially, promises that my feelings are going to survive, that they will last longer than this present moment, and they're an expression of my sense that our place in each other's life will in some way make our lives better, better than they would have been without each other. For that reason, we want to come to know each other better. And one thing about having a friend or being in love with somebody is the desire to come to know them better. As John Williams, author of a wonderful novel called Stoner, wrote, love is not an end, but a process through which one person attempts to know another. That commitment to the future, the hope for a better life that remains unknown for now, is exactly what every one of our efforts to explain the grounds of our friendships always and necessarily leaves out. That is why they're also disappointing. They all contain an implicit and so on, an open end or ellipsis that reveals that the friendship is still alive. Because it is when the ellipsis disappears, when we feel that we know exactly why we have been attracted to someone, and that our future together will be just like our past, that we are in fact no longer attracted to them. We've exhausted them, as we say. In fact, we haven't exhausted them. We've exhausted our interest in them, which is a very different thing. Because there's always more to them. We just don't care about it anymore. This forward uh, element the forward-looking element in friendship makes every relationship like that risky. Why? Because when I approach you in friendship, I hope that you will make me wish for things I couldn't even have thought to wish for without you. I give you power over myself and trust you not to exploit it. I put my identity at risk because despite the certainty that love inspires, it is impossible for me to know what our relationship will actually mean for me and whether it will be for good or bad. Nothing ensures that my feeling or my judgment is right, that I won't one day realize that you have actually been a disappointment, even a harm. Worse, nothing ensures that our relationship won't harm my own judgment, making me eventually feel happy to have become someone I would have hated to be before I met you. <laughs> so I don't realize that you have actually destroyed my life, and I like this destroyed life. <laughs> This commitment, this commitment to a still unknown future that can't possibly be described is what every effort to explain why we love someone always leaves out. The self then is elusive because it is always unfinished business and it's also not a thing. But also because since different aspects of our personalities are involved in our different friendships, to love all, the f all my friends for themselves is not to love the same thing in them all. The self we love in each particular case consists of different features of our various friends and crucially what we suspect or hope they can be as a result of our interaction on the basis of what we know already. Moreover, my friends have other friends and they love one another for themselves and the features their friends are focused on are bound to be different from those that are important to me. If I and someone else are both your friends and love you for yourself, the self we love is bound to be at least a little different. For the same reason, my own self, the friends myself love, is different 
within each one of my various functions. Because of their desire to create a different, unanticipated future, if you want, friends give each other power over it, give, give each other power and put their respective identities in question. That, I think, is the reason we don't ultimately know why we love them. We do love them for reasons we don't rightly understand. But when we approach another in friendship, we don't take ourselves for granted either. We come to each other with a sense that our friendship will allow us to function at our best, improving what we already know of ourselves, engaging parts of which we have been unaware, and leading us to new features that, we'll hope, that we hope will also be to the good. However convinced we may be that everything will work out as well in the end, however, our coming together is always a commitment to an uncertain future. Our lives and the lives of our friends are indissolubly mixed, and the more so, the closer we are, and our lives develop, for better or worse, in ways and directions made possible only by our relationships with one another. So, that I love you for yourself because of who you are is only a partial truth. It also depends on who I happen to be. The full truth lies in Montaigne's non-explanation. If you press me to say why I love you, I can only answer because it is you, because it is I. Thank you very much. reasons that depend on the particular situation, if there's generalizations here, it's only psychologists who would be able to make them. I don't know what, why it happens. What I do know is when those things do happen, sometimes it's because you see something in your friend that you hadn't seen before and you don't like it. You feel betrayed or whatever. But very often, you lose touch. And then the other friend may not change at all. And yet, the same features that attracted you to that person before no longer attracted you to them. So what that implies, in my view, is that the features that we see in our friends are not only a function of their personality, it's, they're also a function of who we are, right? So, and, that, and we talked about earlier, right? We always say about people, you know, I don't know what she sees in him or what he sees in her, right? But they do see something. <coughs> And the, the presence of the subjective element there, or the existence of the attraction, is part of the reason why those uh, features become relevant and salient. So I don't want to be a complete subjectivist about it, about it but I do think there is a subjective element in, in, those, in that situation. Okay. Okay. Yes? So how does that subjective commitment overcome the betrayal that you talk about? It may not. It may not. So, you know, it depends. Sometimes the betrayal may not be all that important, or sometimes you know your friend can acknowledge that it was a mistake. You can acknowledge it. If it's serious, if somebody betrays, not so much anything else, but what it was that you thought they were, then the thing just collapses. Because at that point, you can no longer be confident that what you will learn about them in the future or the way that you will change as a result of knowing them in the future is going to be for the good. So at that point. But the worst, the worst aspect is when you're just bored. You know, when you think, you know, we've done everything there is to do here. And then you become indifferent. And that, I think, is the contrary. The true contrary of love is indifference, and not hatred. Hatred is already in the game. And similarly, with beauty and ugliness. Ugliness is not really the negation of beauty, because ugliness, you notice a thing, and if you notice it, you might even end up finding it beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's nondescriptness that really is. The things you don't notice mm -hmm. are the things that are the opposite of beauty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes? 
Uh, one thing that you say uh, is that you kind of depart from Aristotle's view of friendship and virtue. Oh, philia and virtue. Philia, yeah, as being uh, inextricably bound together. Um, because you say that philia can also oh, oh, I see what you mean. Yes, yes. Uh, Sorry, friendship, friendship yeah. and virtue. You're talking about the, the, the best. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you said because friendship can also lead you down a path that brings you to a place where before the friendship you would have hated yourself for being that. Uh, but then you say that you hope still that your friendship will lead you to virtue. Uh, is that but I didn't say virtue, right? <coughs> I said that it would be good for me. Right. Not the same. Okay. But no, the, the point... Um, so what, what exactly is your question? Uh, I think my question was, um, by saying that friendship kind of separates you from virtue, I think I misunderstood what you were talking oh, about. Oh, no. There is a difference between what I think about what we I'd call close friendships, and what Aristotle called virtue from here. Uh, Aristotle thinks that the, the virtues are objective features uh, of a person. So you end up being wise and prudent and uh, a great soul and all that sort of thing. I see you, I recognize those virtues, and I become your friend. Uh, I want to say that no, it doesn't work that way. That would be too objective a <coughs> way to put it. It's that when I am your friend, the features that I cite as the reasons that I'm your friend, I will consider virtues, even if traditionally they're not. Right? And what happens very often when we lose interest in somebody is that those features no longer look like virtues. <laughs> they look like regular. Yeah. Is that? Yes. Is that nice. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I noticed about your conception of friendship is that. Um, you know, it's defined as aestheticized and epistemically irreducible. You can't fully know why you're friends with somebody. Um, okay. And is that is that correct? Right? Okay. Um, and at the same time, though, it still seems to suppose this orientation towards becoming or this orientation um, towards the future, as you stated, without really committing itself to the teleology of Aristotle or the consequentialism of end space reasoning. And I suppose my question going along with Mr. Wurzba's is, um, you still mentioned, though, that there is sort of this end goal of gaining something that's good out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how would you, again, maybe distinguish that a little bit more from Aristotle's conception of the good? Um, why do we have this directedness while it not at the same time being just this objectivized goodness? Well, for Aristotle, you know where it's going to lead. You know what the virtues are, and you know the kind of behavior that those virtues uh, underwrite. You can't predict the particular action, but you know that if a person is wise, they will act wisely from now on. Given my own view that there is no set feature here that is a virtue or isn't a virtue, you do not know whether that will lead, where that will lead. And that's where the danger is. Uh, because, you know, and can I tell the TV story? Okay. The, the best example of this notion of being the degenerate and not realizing it hit me when I first started enjoying television. <laughs> when I first came to America, you know, I, you know, television, you know, it's fat people who wear blue flannel work shirts and actually putting that hair to sit on those couches and the stuff it was coming out. And all that. Only people like that. Yeah. Uh, then I was writing my book on Nietzsche, subletting a place that had a color TV. I didn't have one. And I was exhausted at night, so I started watching TV. And after a while, I watched enough. I said, if I don't do something with that, I would have wasted a large part of my life. So I started writing about it. And I think that it was a good thing. I think it made me a better philosopher to be interested in popular culture. But my friend John Cooper thinks that I'm a degenerate. <laughs> Not in such strong terms, but, you know. He thinks that's yeah, it's iffy. And the question now is, how do you decide? Which standards do I use? Do I use my current standards that tell me that this is perfectly fine, or do I go back to my standards beforehand, which now seem to me stupid, but which I accepted as much as I accept my current standards, and decide that I was living, that I am living a degenerate life? And it's that in those cases where we don't know whether, or we don't know that, in some cases, we are living a degenerate life that I think are the worst danger. Because when somebody disappoints you, you're disappointed, you're crushed and all that, but at least you can go on on your own. 
In the other case, you're within a context that you're not controlling and you're not aware of the kind of context. Let me see if there's anybody on there. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, on the same question of subjectivity, uh, in chapter six of your book on friendship, you oh, deal yeah. with the <laughs> tough question <laughs> what friendship is really for, especially if friends can sometimes make each other do bad things. Um, and you use the movie Thelma and Louise to right. illustrate that as an example, uh, in which the two main characters help each other develop their individuality, but also encourage each other to commit crimes, and it doesn't end well for either of them. Oh, uh, well, well, don't say that. Well, well, <laughs> it's a heroic end. <laughs> and, so, you also, you know how <laughs> so you also mentioned how common it is for uh, friends to encourage each other to do harmful drugs or just something that's not good for them. Um, and you make the argument that uh, these cases show that friendship isn't in itself inherently good, instead calling it a non-moral value. That, no, no, those are not the same. It's not, in a, and it's not a good, it's not the same as it's not a moral value. Okay. It, it is a value, but not a moral one. Okay. So what I want to do, and what this whole project is part of, is something that I've worked before in an aesthetics book, and I'm continuing with, is that in philosophy especially, but generally in, in public discourse, we, en we have ended up recognizing only basically two sources of value. Self-interest, on the one hand, or morality, on the other. I want to say there's a huge area of values between those two. Values that are neither values of self-interest, namely what is, what is am I going to get out of it, and they're not moral values either. They are what I would call either aesthetic or personal values, or something like that. friendship and beauty are two of the most central values. So I don't, the reason they're not moral values is that they can be misused, whereas we think at least that a moral value or a virtue can be misused. The wise person, if they are wise, will always decide the right thing. The good friend will not always advise the best thing, even if they are very good friends. So that's the difference. Does that help a bit? Uh, yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, but my specific question was, would you call someone a good friend if they're causing you to do something bad? Like, is that necessarily a part of friendship, or is that them failing to uphold their end of the bargain? Like, being a bad friend? It's a very good question, but I think it depends on what turns out. Like, these two women do those bad things. They are bad things. They, they you know, one of them shoots somebody, they rob the store, they imprison the policeman in the trunk of his car, they blow up the oil tanker. Yeah, but in the process, they both become self-sufficient individuals, something that they clearly were not at the beginning of the film. So the question is, how do you balance this? And my view is that, well, look, this is a good friendship. It did something tremendous for them, even though they did bad things. And that's another reason why I don't think that friendship is a moral value. Because a moral value would not have led them to do bad things. Okay. Can I stay with the students, or is it time for the faculty? Yeah, you could say yeah, that. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, um, so one thing that we've kind of talked about, like, I think modern life has this culture. We, we are, we're always busy, we're so busy, and a lot of our friendships are ones based on convenience. People would work with people, we go to class with. Well, that, that happens all the time. They, yeah, before that, it was your village or your farm. Yeah. <laughs> but how do you go about building these really deep and binding friendships? Like, what do you recommend as a thing to pursue such deep friendships? I'm a philosopher. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I don't, I, I really don't know what it is that one should look for. Um, I think I'd better not say anything because anything I say would be banal and stupid. Um, <laughs> just try. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In your book, you mentioned that Epicurus says that what matters in friendship is not so much what our friends actually do for us as a sense that they would come to our aid if we ever need them. Right. In your example of Tom had me thinking, you were talking about him in a way such that he seems like the kind of person that would have gotten out in his pajamas and changed the tire for anyone. Mm -hmm. well, no. No, it's not his. Although, he actually, now that you mentioned it. <laughs> 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 so I'm curious if if the case is that you know maybe he's just a virtuous person or he, he would do 
the kind of things for people like that. Right, he has all <coughs> kinds of flaws. Right. So what what distinguishes somebody who has these good characteristics that would do like if there is a person who would do anything for anyone if they ever asked it of them, how do you distinguish them being a good person for anyone who asks versus them being a good friend to you specifically? Well, I don't think anybody would do anything that anybody asked. I mean, there's always right. tremendous circumscription of the area. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's a very good point that I think that Tom might have done the same thing for some other hapless individual who didn't know how to change his tire. But that's because it's he. In that case, he wouldn't have done it out of friendship. Right? Mm -hmm. He would have done it because that's the kind of person he is. Whereas in my case, I can say it was the friendship that motivated him. Remember what I said before, it's not the behavior, it's not the activities that establish whether a relationship is a friendship or not. It's the motives from which one acts. All right, fair enough. All right, Pablo uh, Luis. Um, the, uh, so, um, you know, we watched it since your recommendation. The, um, and I know you watch the play and you watch the movie. It, 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 you, 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 you've been rich our lives. <laughs> you know, in, 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 in the, um, and in watching Thelma and Louise, I was, I was not convinced that they actually did much of anything that was morally bad. Ah, in the, that, that's, enough, that's a very interesting to put it. Yes. So, in, in other words, like, so uh, Louise shoots a guy. But the guy's a rapist. The, um, Not yet. The, well, he was he was working on it. Shooting <laughs> 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 somebody is pretty drastic, <laughs> especially <laughs> especially if you do it after you've already left. Yeah, sure, sure. There's, there's no. He swears in that. That's why you shoot. That, that's right. But we, but we, the viewers, see the guy as a soldier. He has no redeeming qualities in our eyes. Same thing with the truck driver who's truck dead boy. The, um, he's a total sleeper. Yeah, they're, they're fairly nice to the police when they stick in the trunk. The, she, uh, she shoots the holes in so he can, right, so can have some air, right? <laughs> you know, she doesn't steal his beer, which is, you know, the, you know sort of by help. But the, um, the, so I think that movie is not about the tension between, between what you, developing a style, which I think is one way you describe it, or developing one's individuality and morality, but the tension between morality and law, right? In other words, they're, they're breaking the law a lot, but they're more like vigilantes, more like Robin Hood, than they are like... But look, if you have any kind of Kantian view of morality, right. you will think that those are immoral divisions, because that's to treat people as means, nearly as means, right? right. And you go and you rob them, right? <laughs> Uh, right. So uh, that's the kind of moral background that I have in my as a kind of Kantian universalizability uh, type of morality. You're right, there is also, between morality and the law, there is that issue right. there in, the, in the film. But there's a sense in which, let's put it that way, those guys, those two women, are doing bad things. Killing somebody, even if they're a terrible person, is not the right thing to do. So get them arrested or whatever, <coughs> you know, uh, uh, threaten with a gun until the police comes. That's what a good citizen would do. Not because a guy you know, says something nasty and not seen going and shooting him. That's a bit overreacting. Can I just follow up? Yes. I think their friendship, precisely their friendship and their individuality are, are formed around what you might call a moral crusade, right? I mean, they, they both see this wrong that men are doing to women and that's I agree about that. I mean, I think, I don't know that they see it as a moral wrong because I'm not completely sure where uh, the behavior falls here. It's a bad behavior, there's no question about it. Whether it's immoral or not, I would, I could spend some time discussing with you. <laughs> it's, a, it's an attempted rape. Well, it not well, it's a terrible thing to do, but to say that you know, their reaction is coming, is, you know, destroying immorality, I think, is not right, right? Because you don't, you know, I mean, okay, I fall back to the banality. Two wrongs to make, right? Yeah. Right? Uh, leaving aside the question of whether they're pursuing the correction of the immoral act in the right way, they're still, they're, they're coming together. You know, they're both becoming closer. Yes. And they're, as you, as you bring out, they're realizing their own selves and individuality, right? 
by being on this model, whether they're maybe mistaken about the, the need for the super. I don't see it as a more, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I don't see it as a more crusade. Maybe you can say that shooting the man has this, or, you know, has this kind of aspect. But what they do later? What about the, the, truck, what? the truck driver? Who they well, this is a pure case of revenge. It's not <laughs> <laughs> more hot. I mean, they, the guy is really nasty to them and makes dirty gestures and dirty suggestions. And what they do, they blow up his oil tanker. They make a fireball out of it. Well, that is, to say the least, not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an overreaction, but, you know, I think it's, it's a film or Louise. One of them gives him a very nice little moral catechism on how to treat ladies before she blows up his truck. <laughs> how to treat ladies is not a moral principle. How to treat people is a moral principle. How, moral principle. how to treat ladies, you already so, brought a non-moral category. Right. And so maybe maybe the difference that we're having is that you're interpreting the word, the word morality simply in, 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 in terms of this Kantian universalized Absolutely. framework. Yeah. The, um, and so there's consequentialist stuff to that, but mostly I'm thinking of the Kantian, okay. Kantian approach to morality. Okay. And I think maybe we're thinking of it in a more Aristotelian framework, but maybe that's... In which case, I would say, don't call it moral, call it ethical, and we'll agree. <laughs> As I was saying before, well, no, I mean, it's not just a matter of, of uh, words. I think that we have, as I said before, we've tended to identify all values with either self interested values, which, according to Kantian morality, are not moral uh, values, and those impartial moral values. Right? I want to say look, moral values are only one species of value. The genus is ethical values, and ethical values are the values that determine whether a life is lived well or not. But not all that makes life good is moral. Mm -hmm. See, art is another thing. Friendship is another thing. And many other things as well. Okay. Let's take one or two more. Oh, that's right. Coming back to the topic. Uh, <laughs> 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 there. <Yes. laughs> Sorry, why do you say that? The less you have to describe the less. The less accurate words you have to. Oh, you mean the, 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 the less you seem to know about it. Is that what you mean? No, no, no. The less descriptive words that accurate, accurately describe why you love that person. The more you love them, the more difficult it is to explain. The, the reason why that is is because language is, language is symbols, right? They are symbols. For, for experiences. And the experiences that you have are specific to you. The s experiences that you have with another person are specific between you and that other person. So if, and if it is funny because you can have the same experience with two different people and have completely different feelings about this. Well, then it's all the same experience, is it? No. Not. How could it be the same? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, but so not being able to explain the relationship with someone isn't an issue. It just illuminates the fact that you are so close to them and you have such a strong bond to them that these symbols, these descriptions. No, mm, mm. I see what you mean. I, 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 I'm not going to accept your view that language is a bunch of symbols and that what they are about is experience. Language is about experience, it's about things, it's about people, it's about many things, right? Not just experience. I'm just not reporting what I feel when I use language. I do well, many things. if I say a chair, I'm only going to think of the chairs uh, that I've seen. We should talk about that afterward because <laughs> this is really a very complex philosophical issue about the nature of language, and I don't think we're going to resolve it here. But it's a very important topic because many people think it's precisely because language can't do it. It's that. The, the only problem here is that our language can't capture. I don't think it's because language can't capture. I think we can't capture either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a 
have you taken much time to think what it might be like if you were able to accurately describe them? Because I feel like, I mean... Well, we can do it in Polish. Right. Metaphor, you see, metaphor will do it. And that's why real lovers, when they have to explain themselves, say, shall I compare thee to a summer day? You know, or, you know, and so on and so forth. As long as you're within the meta, with, with, within the metaphorical or the artistic uh, uh, domain, right, you're using language the way that, <laughs> the, in other words, you, by using poetry, you are inserting the and so on. Because it's never exactly that, it's never only that, and it's never all that. But it's much <coughs> worse, much worse. Because the, the second language, artistic language, or painting, or whatever, music, can actually uh, sort of stimulate the emotion much, much more. Do you know more about it? I mean, how many people have written to each other, shall I compare it to a summer day? Thousands. <laughs> Do they all have the same feelings? Even there, it's still general. The, the difficulty here, to come back to, to our discussion, is that it's impossible to express individuality in linguistic terms. We try to express it by saying, it's not intelligence, it's her way of being intelligent, or her particular intelligence, or her intelligence, not just intelligence in general. But when you try to explain what her particular intelligence is, you end up being incomplete again. L language is, by its, by its nature, uh, uh, general. That way. We have specific terms to refer to individuals, right? But we don't, so to speak, uh, communicate that individuality. That's a very difficult thing to do, perhaps even impossible. Art is closer, comes closer to it. Right, Joel, I think we're going to have to call it there. The, um, just before you go, um, reception right outside. Stick around, talk, ask questions if you didn't get to. The, um, and join us February 21st for Diana Schaub on Race French for the Let's thank Professor Donald.